My earliest memory of religion is sitting in a pew in a Victorian church with my cars on the little ledge in front that the prayer books went on and uh, my mum sitting one side of me and my nanny, my mother's mother, sitting the other side of me and the smell of them both and that lovely smell of home and and mothers and um, feeling warm and safe and, and loving every minute of it. My dad in the pulpit preaching, I can remember a sermon about licorice all sorts and that when you open a packet of licorice all sorts they're all different, they're all colourful, um, they all taste lovely, um, they're all sweet but they all look so different. And that was a bit like the people in church. I remember that was the, the message, and I don't know where he went with that, but I remember that. I honour the anger and indeed fury of members of the LGBTI community who see in this report hard stones where they looked for bread. I'm grateful to the House of Bishops for stating so clearly their support for the traditional teaching of the church. We disagree about the interpretation of scripture. We disagree about whether God wants to bless or to judge same-sex relationships. I was bullied at school for being gay. I now feel I'm being bullied at Synod for being same-sex attracted and faithful to the teaching of Jesus on marriage. My understanding of what scripture says about sex and marriage and the fact that I do not have a husband leads me to believe that I must live a celibate life. The two positions are irreconcilable. We need to trust each other, trust in our maturity in Christ, to sit across the table with each other and see in each other the face of Christ despite our divisions. And we need love, I need love. Oh God, do we all need love to hear a little genuine heartfelt love in this debate because it hasn't been there much. I remember telling my mother about wanting to be a priest. She was more concerned about that than when I told her about me being gay about five years later. Because she said, but Andrew, you're, I can't, you're not, you like money and nice things too much. You're too, I can't see you as being a priest at all. She was probably right, <laughs> actually. <laughs> yeah. And when, I was, when, I, when I told her I was gay, she just said, well, I just want you to be happy. She was more concerned about me being a priest and all that goes with it than she was about me being gay. It's interesting, isn't it? So the next month uh, involves preparation for my ordination as a priest. This morning, in fact, I've been having meetings about my first Mass, which is the first time I will preside at Communion. That is something I really look forward to. I'm very nervous about it, of course, but that's the sort of fulfillment of wanting to be a priest, to preside at the Eucharist. I'm approaching 58, so if we look back and think that I sort of thought that I was different, called to something different around the age of six, so it's a been a long time coming, 52 years of waiting, and uh, it's wonderful. I'm so excited. About a month ago, I got a civil partnership. Uh, in fact, we had three services. Um, the Church of England is quite complicated uh, in that it permits its priests to be civilly partnered and permits there to be a service of prayer and dedication following that, but it doesn't permit uh, vows to be said in the service or blessings to be said. We did have a church service, um, so we can't have everything we would want in the church service and we definitely couldn't have the standard marriage service. And that is sad. I mean, I do weddings all the time for people, um, for couples who are straight, and I generally I, I find 
but I don't feel the pain of not being able to have what they have. Um, but I have had a few where I've just felt twinges of sadness as I've been able to engage with them and have their, rejoice with their special day and then just go home and sit there with a cup of tea wishing that I could have that too and feeling the injustice of the fact that it's not the same. My husband's an atheist and when we met our first date I told him I was a priest. I said now I'm going to go to the loo whilst you digest that and I went out of the restaurant to the loo which is kind of giving me a chance to decide either to disappear and leave me with the bill or stay and ask me questions. He called all his friends and most of them said just leave but he stayed. And we've been in conversation about the differences between our faiths ever since. We decided not to have a civil partnership. Civil partnerships were sort of, you can't have marriage, but you can have this. And that's not equality. And I don't really want to be treated as a sort of subspecies who gets something specially created, um, which doesn't carry all the same rights and the same legal recognitions that everybody else gets. Then you already knew the circumstances that I was in a civil partnership from my paperwork. So they don't have to ask, are you gay? They know you are. But you have to, at some point, to say that you have read the bishop's statement on sexuality and that you will abide by it. The policy that uh, gay people are celibate. I had an internal battle because the way I still felt in my heart of hearts, at the core of my being, that it wasn't wrong. And yet, obviously, when one reads the Bible literally, it sounds and reads as if this is wrong. But I didn't turn my back on the church, despite what the official word of the church at that time might have been saying. I mean, it had worked very hard at getting the decriminalisation of, of homosexuality. But still, it had never changed its own view of gay people, perhaps in the pew, but more so as clergy. Let us hear the word of God. Cast away from you all your transgressions and make you a new heart. I just thought you might be thirsty. Serve water. God bless. Thank you. I am. I'm a minister. I Church of England minister. I don't agree with you, I'm afraid, but I just thought I wanted to bless you anyway. I wanted to bless you whatever you, whatever you think, whatever I think. Anyway. What if you're wrong? What if the Bible doesn't say what you think it says? I'm not because I'm not. It took 16 years for me to come through to the truth and then God showed me... Do you have a background in, in, in lesbian yourself is that no I, I have a background in primitive Methodism but oh. Well, we're all sinners. <laughs> well, God loves, God loves the church. God loves the world. John 3, 16. God, God so loved the world. We listen to all of God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Before, that's before anyone was a Christian. Where is God's love on that side? Well, he had to flee from the wrath. Well, I don't see the word love there. Well, the word flee means love, doesn't it? It's interesting the story of the centurion coming to Jesus to heal his servant. He could get another servant. That was the attitude of those days. And amongst some theologians now, they would now think this centurion loved this servant. He didn't want him to suffer or die. He asked Jesus to heal him and Jesus did. I'm not saying this was a gay relationship. It's the closest we've possibly got to a loving relationship between two men in the Bible who were not disciples. And geez, that's how Jesus dealt with it. He healed. That's very telling for me. I'm lucky in that I didn't go through the self-hatred that most LGBT people do. I just thought, well, you know, if this is what I am, then it's God's problem. I'd read a huge amount of um, uh, 
novels about single spinster missionaries going to Africa and you know saving the world as it were um, which you know I now have a bit of critique about but the one thing I did take away from that was that you didn't need to be married to a man to be able to make a difference. A few friends really challenged me to re-explore what does the Bible really say about this. Actually meeting people who are sane and Christian and just a few years older than me and I thought I can do this this is this does not mean I have to throw everything out. The evangelical church is just who I am. Until you end up with the acknowledgement that gay people are not just liberals, that it'll just be a fight between evangelicals and liberals, until they realise it's their own daughters and sons that are facing these issues, and maybe even their wives and brothers and sisters and bishops, then it becomes a sort of an issue about the other, and it's very easy to maintain a fight rather than have a conversation. I was really a Christian from a very young age, I think. Um, I remember my baptism well, because I was three, and um, I, uh, I joined in all my baptismal vows. I've always believed in God. I've always, um, I've always wanted to go to church, actually. It's how I make sense of my, of my world and the things that happen to me, um, the things which drive me, the things that drive the world around me. My sexuality, perhaps, clashed with cultural expectations. Um, not with my faith, and not with, um, not with the sort of faith I'd grown up in. I officially resign tomorrow. I sign my papers tomorrow. 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 What do you have to do to do that? They, they've sent me um, a deed of resignation, which I have to sign, and date, and send back to them. And that's it. I'm out the door. When Stephen and I married in 2014, it was made very clear to me that should I ever leave these parishes, that would be the end of my life as a priest in the Church of England. I'm on a blacklist, basically. They couldn't get me out of the parishes in which I currently serve because I'm on an old form of employment. Last summer, with Brexit, Stephen lost his job. We went through a period of him trying to find new work, and the job that he got is in Manchester. We knew that once I resign from here, my ministry as a priest in the Church of England comes to an end. So I have to leave the job that I've done for 30 years. When did you first consider ordination? It was something that I'd, um, I'd wondered about for some years and um, quite a lot of people had suggested to me it might be my calling. I think a lot of people assumed that was what um, I would end up doing. The time I felt that I had to pursue it was at a service when I, the Lord of Sea and Sky, was sung. And I was in tears. I knew this is actually the time I can't keep on putting this off. I felt for a long time I had to put it off. It's about not feeling up, was not feeling up to it, not feeling adequate for it. Um, I thought okay, now is the time to explore it. Ten and a half years ago, I was paralysed by a virus and lost the ability to walk. I could just move me, my arms a little, I could move my head, but uh, I couldn't see, um, I couldn't speak very well. My speech became blurred and it happened in, within two days. It sounds very frightening, but I wasn't frightened at all because I felt warm and I felt as if somebody was holding me up. I, didn't, I couldn't almost feel the bed. I just felt held. I've since discovered this is something that happens, that people go through this sort of religious experience of being held. And so I wasn't afraid. I wasn't afraid to die if that was God's will. But um, God decided I was to live. 
And uh, I, des I decided that, gosh, if God wants me to live, then maybe now is the time. So there'd been a lot of nerve damage in the pelvic area. So not only did it mean that uh, I couldn't control um, bladder and bowels, but I had no sexual function. It gradually came back a little, but not much. And so this, some people could say this is God, you know, <laughs> clearing the way because I could then lead a celibate life. I don't think God is like that, actually. But certainly somehow or other that paralysis made me question my own life and I wanted to give something back to God. I thought I'd been saved for a reason. And so um, I did say yes to ordained ministry. And it's wonderful that I can bring my partner with me into ministry and that he is a major part of that ministry. I decided that I was going to get married despite the opposition. In fact, almost because of the opposition, because it doesn't seem right to be told what is right for my relationship um, by people who know nothing about it. The nastiness and the pressure from the church and from a lot of fellow Christians, the abuse, the letters, the texts and the emails, the occasional phone call with abuse shouted down the phone, the name calling, all of that's been pretty unpleasant. My bishop here um, called me in for an interview when he heard I was about to get, wanting to get married and did his level best to persuade me not to get married um, and, and tried a number of different tacks to do that including a bit of bullying, a bit of threatening, a bit of cajoling, a bit of asking, a touch of pleading, um, all of which I said no to. I could see the sense of frustration and growing anger in him throughout the conversation that I wasn't just going to kowtow and do as asked. I, I did restrain myself from asking him how his husband was the man he'd been living with for 30 years, who was upstairs in the house whilst we were having this conversation, which would have been a little provocative. Um, it did make me wonder at quite what he thought he was doing, um, calling me out for being open and honest and public in my relationship and wanting to make a public lifetime commitment to the man that I had been living with for uh, 13 years, whilst the man that he'd been living with for 30 years um, wasn't acknowledged publicly. You do have to wonder at, the, at that, don't you? There are nine criteria that one has to, has to sort of hit to become a um, priest. They wrote some reports that was really where I got up to, because at the point where um, the DDA saw the reports, and um, um, uh, yes, yes, that was where that was where um, that was where the car crash started. I received the assessor's reports, and the assessor on the pastoral criteria wrote what I considered to be very inappropriate remarks about my sexuality, um, because it, I mean, it had been. Um, um, sexuality had been mentioned by one of the referees um, and so it was then at that point that I spoke to the diocesan director of ordinance who said that unless I was willing to live within the guidelines of issues in human sexuality the process couldn't carry on any further. If you see your partner with their clothes off is that okay? If you peck on the cheek when they're going off to work, is that okay? What is celibacy? Is, is it okay to have a hug? Is it okay to lie next to each other in bed with nothing on? It's a grey area and I guess that's how the church wishes to leave it. I asked to speak to the bishop. I went, I, I went to see him and he said it was what everyone does. I pointed out that um, I didn't think that the, the sort of the Nuremberg defence was a particularly 
um, helpful defence for a Christian to make. Um, I'm just doing it because everyone else does, was following orders. Um, but um, I had the meeting of the diocesan director of ordinance herself, and you know it was made clear at that point that the process would not be able to continue as things were, regardless of um, anything else, really, regardless of any kind of um, anything to do with the whole assessment of my vocation. What was that conversation like? Um, numbing. Hmm. And how did you come away feeling? Numb. Um, angry and I mean there may well have been other factors behind what happened next but it was the catalyst to anxiety and to depression it was certainly it was certainly the catalyst that was what propelled it forward I was born into this C of E of ours and I love it. And I think it's better to change things from within than shout on the outside, heckle from the outside. Be in something and try to change it just by being who you are, being honest and open and loving and kind. And um, hope to change it in small ways by the witness that you give. We, we need each other, um, but I think if you just have groundbreakers, they remain as external groundbreakers. Um, and you need people to be able to have the backroom conversations and be able to support. And I think also my role is, is partly also to support people who are, while all of this is being argued and fought over, you have every day 
LGBT people who are like 14 and 18 and 25 and 35 and 55 who are just trying to get on with their lives or who are leaving the church over this. It would have happened now about, um, it's more than three years ago, um, but it's been a gradual process of, um, of trying to come to acceptance. Um, and it's really acceptance that things are not necessarily going to be the way that I want them to be. My grandmother used to say, speak the truth and shame the devil. And I, I think that the truth is that the church's attitude towards the LGBTI communities is shameful and discriminatory and wrong. And you have to say that. And you have to keep saying it repeatedly to shame the church. I keep telling myself I'm facing this with a sense of relief. Um, I suspect I'll be quite nervous because I am cutting myself off from everything I've known for 30 years and there is no way back in the current Church of England. I'm sure I'm going to miss the public profile that goes with it. The recognisability on the street when you walk around with a dog collar on and everyone goes, well, that's the vicar. I'm going to miss that. But I'm just going to have to find a way of just being me, rather being Andrew rather than Father Andrew. We do not believe in inclusion because it is fashionable or because what society wants us to do. We believe in inclusion because this is what God is all about. Your support for that message, your commitment to it across the years, has made it possible for me to speak out to the wider church about what it means, despite the cost. And I know better than any of you that these parishes have been made to suffer because of my outspokenness. I am deeply grateful to each and every one of you for having had my back across the recent past and supporting me even when at times it must have been hard to do so. I will never forget that care and support for me and for Stephen. Now I am sad to be leaving you, truly I am sad to be leaving you. These parishes, you, are in every way the greatest work of my life. You will always be deep in my heart and in my prayers. Pray for me. You know I will pray for you. Amen.